Hi friends, and thanks so much for joining me today for this teaching. Uh, we've been in a series that I've termed scriptural imagery, and something that we must understand about the, the Bible is that the Bible is a series of books written by ancient Near Eastern people to ancient Near Eastern people. And so as such, they had a specific way that they communicated, and that involved creating a lot of images with their words. How many of you have heard, you know, a picture paints a thousand words? Well, this is very true. And so ancient Near Eastern people communicated using a lot of imagery that they created with their words. And so for us to understand the Bible, which was written in ancient times to an ancient people and an ancient audience, we need to understand how they communicated. And so the scriptures were written for us, but it was written to them. And, and so I'm so grateful for the scriptures, but if we don't understand context, we lose a whole bunch of the, of, of the vision and a, a whole bunch of the purpose and the message. And so if you can imagine with me um, getting a letter that was written from someone that you knew a little bit about to someone you knew a little bit about and you're right you're reading this letter that has some specific language and details maybe somebody was sick and you're like wow this was written a couple weeks ago are they sick with aids are they sick with covid are they sick with the flu you know what what is this sickness about you wouldn't understand the context and so a lot of times with scripture we're kind of in a little bit of a um a vacuum on information and context and so when a message is lifted out of its context you don't really have much capability of understanding what's being communicated and so I say this that that text taken out of context is a pretext to make the text say whatever you want you know the the, the media does this all the time they give us all these facts, they give us all these details and statistics, but they pull it straight out of, uh, disconnect it from any context. And so we don't really know what the full story is. And so same thing with scripture. We need to understand the context. And so we've been in a series that I've termed scriptural imagery, and I want to name this episode apocalyptic imagery. And so I want to read out of the first chapter of the book of Revelation and We'll begin to touch on this. We're not going to have time to go into a great deal of detail, but we need to understand the context that the book of Revelation was written in. Apart from that, we're in a dark hole. Okay, we're, 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 we're grasping for information that's hard to get. And so, um, and so I want you to get your Bible out, and I want you to start to underline some of these things that I'll tell you about because it's important. All right, and so the context is, in my opinion, I believe the book of Revelation was probably written in around 67 or 68 AD by the Apostle John, who was exiled to the Isle of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. The Isle of Patmos was off the west coast of what we call today Turkey. In the Bible, it was called Asia Minor. All right, and it was written to seven churches who were dispersed about in a crescent shape that was part of a mail route in ancient under the ancient Roman Empire. And so the Isle of Patmos was off here in the sea. There's loads and loads of islands here in the Aegean Sea and in the Mediterranean that I didn't put on here for the sake of time. Down here is Crete, over here would be the Mediterranean Sea. Here is Greece, the city of Athens is here. The city of Corinth would have been over here where Paul wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians. That's the audience he wrote that to. Thessalonica would have been up in here somewhere. In, in Greece, and Paul wrote First and Second Thessalonians to them. And so this is the ancient context in which the book of Revelation and the Revelation was communicated to the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos. Um, and this was under the administration of the Roman Emperor Nero Caesar, who was referred to in terrible terms. He was a terrible ruler. He was very perverse. Uh, he was more interested in being an actor and a singer and a performer than he was being the emperor of Rome. And so uh, he persecuted the Christians. He hated the Christians. Um, and so this was the context. And so the letter is written to these seven churches. And so first and foremost, coming out of the gate, we need to understand that's the intended audience. Okay, remember what was the intended message by the writer? What was the intended audience by the reader? Okay, that's called audience relevance. And so I want to read the first 
few ver uh, verses of chapter 1 in the book of Rome, uh, Revelation, and I want you to underline a few things. And so the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's revealing Jesus Christ in some way. It's where we get the term uh, apocalypsis or apocalypse. It's from the Greek term apocalypsis. And so it starts out, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things which must soon take place. Underline, must soon take place. Key. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Underline, for the time is near. All right, and so immediately we have some context of the audience and who it was written to and the time frame. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, Asia Minor, Turkey, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of, of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Underline coming with the clouds. That's a repetitive theme, and I've talked to you before in previous episodes about making note of repetitive themes, okay? Coming with clouds is a repetitive theme. You see it when he came against Babylon. You see it when he came when, when God judged the nation of Egypt, the nation of Babylon, and the nation of Israel. Uh, every eye will see him, and even those who pierced him. Underline, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth who will wail on account of him, even so, amen. And so that's the first chapter of the book of Revelation, verses 1 through 7. And so here we have some very clear indication of the context, the audience, and the time frame. All right, we've got soon take place, for the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, that's the audience. Um, he's coming with clouds. Again, another apocalyptic um, term. Every I'll see him, and even those who pierced him. Well, who pierced him? Well, he was pierced by the Jews in first century Jerusalem. The Jewish leaders, the chief priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees, and also under the administration of Rome because Rome ruled Judea. And so here now we have a very good context to understand the scripture. And so if you don't already have a good Bible app for your smartphone or for your computer, it will help you immensely. And so if you go into a Bible app and look for terms, and see where those terms show up and how they're repeated and then the context in which they're repeated, you can begin to see a whole lot of things and make some connections that you never would connect. And so one of the things that we see all the time and hear about all the time is this thing called the mark of the beast. And people in our context think that that's talking about us. Well, we see right here that the book of Revelation was written to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And so, again, it's written for us, but it was written to them. And so don't lift it out of that context. And so one of the things we hear all the time is about the mark of the beast. Well, again, I, I've referred to you and mentioned to you that um, New Testament prophetic apocalyptic imagery can be found in the Old Testament. And so just like that thing, uh, he is coming on the clouds or coming with the clouds. Jesus talked about coming with the clouds. Um, Whenever God judged a nation in the Old Covenant, an Old Testament, I'm sorry, uh, it was always He's coming in the clouds. The sun and the moon will go dark. Uh, the rivers will dry up. The people will be killed. There will be no trees. This is all apocalyptic language. And so whenever God judged a nation in the Scripture, He judged them through the army of an enemy nation. And so when He judged Israel, he judged them with the armies of Rome. And so when the armies of 
the enemies of, of uh, people came, it always is accompanied and, and, and termed in apocalyptic language. He's coming in the clouds. He's coming uh, with chariots. He's riding on a cloud. Uh, this is all apocalyptic language. And so this thing of the mark of the beast that we hear about all the time. We think, you know, Bill Gates has been in the news about, or, you know, been, been, we see all kinds of stuff on Facebook and Twitter about Bill Gates, and he's, he's going to chip you, and it's the mark of the beast. No, it's not. Where does the mark of the beast come from? What, what is this? It comes out of the book of Revelation, but again, imagery, it can be found in the Old Testament. And so the mark of 666 on the forehead and on the hand, where does that come from? Well, let me read uh, part of where that comes from. One cle clear clue is the Shema, which is an ancient Israeli prayer um, and is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And once I start reading it, you'll, you'll probably remember of hearing, hearing of it. It says, Hear, O Israel, this is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. We heard Jesus say that many times in the Gospels. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. Now notice this. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, or frontlets on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. All right, and so here again we have a repetitive theme. We see in the book of Revelation something about the mark of the beast on the forehead and on the hands. Well, here we see in the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7, the word of the Lord shall be upon as a sign upon your hand and as frontlets on your forehead. And so that talks about what works you accomplish, the works of your hand and the thoughts of your mind. It doesn't have to do with a literal mark. It has to do with what occupies your thoughts and your deeds. And so, and then later on in the, in the Roman Empire, um, Rome was a tremendously pagan nation. They worshiped all kinds of gods, even to the degree that they had what we, we call imperial worship. They worshiped emperors. And so under Roman Emperor Nero, um, at the gate or the entrance to marketplaces, there would be a statue of the Emperor Nero. Well, in order to go in and buy and sell, you had to offer incense to Nero, burn incense, and which was an act of worship. And then the priest would put some ashes on your hand or on your forehead so that you're, that's kind of like stamping you so that you can go in and buy and sell in the marketplace or what, what uh, in that time was called the Agora. And so can you see now how putting some context to these scriptures that takes so much of the mystery away, listen, we... Obviously, we have things that occupy our, our thoughts and our deeds, but stop thinking that somebody's going to try to put a mark on your forehead and a chip in your hand or a tattoo on you. That really, really is, is it's, it's getting old, it's getting tired, and people are seeing through it. And, you know, I, we've all been there. Gosh, we're all learning. But um, keep in mind all the imagery that you see in the book of Revelation can be found in the Old Testament. Scripture will interpret Scripture. And so, um, thank you so much for listening. So, this, is ep this episode is the fifth episode. Go back and listen to the other ones. Scriptural imagery is a huge thing. I hope that you'll take the time to listen. God bless you, and thank you so much. Hey guys, thanks so much for listening today. You know, sharing the gospel, teaching and preaching, and revealing the mysteries of the kingdom of God are absolutely my passion. And this YouTube channel is just one more resource that we have to freely share the gospel across the world and do our part to make disciples of all nations without regard to time, location, or money. And so the content that I share on here is not what you would typically get in a Sunday morning church service, but rather it's a fearless deep dive into serious biblical issues without regard to popularity or denominational position. And so if you like this material, please click on the red subscribe button below and you'll get notified when I put new content on the channel. Additionally, please feel free to share this on your social media platforms or through an email link. And uh, if you would like to reach me, please use the email address below. And for more information, please go to www.unitedwithchrist.org.